There is a plague that is killing tens of thousands of people in America each year. It is leaving us with millions of decimated families who are having to deal with this problem on a daily basis. The crisis I'm talking about is the opioid epidemic, and also referred to as the prescription pain medication crisis, and it is getting worse and worse every day, and, so, and we're dealing with this in the worst possible way. So I fully understand the scope of this and understand what's really going on. I want to share with you some statistics from the Center for Disease Control, or the CDC. In 2018, we had 2 million people clinically addicted to opioids in the United States. However, because there's very few clinically or socially acceptable alternatives, that number went from 2 million in 2018 to 3 million in 2022. I'll do the math for you. That's 21,000 people added to the addicted list each month, every month, for four years. And if you think that's bad, our death numbers are even worse. In 2019, we lost 50,000 people to opioid overdose. However, in 2020, we lost 70,000 people to opioid overdose. That's a 140% increase in one year. One of the reasons for this is that opioids are one of the most addictive substances we have available to us medically for pain. As a doctor who treats pain on a daily basis, one of the biggest fears my patients have is if they start to choose opioids for their pain, they will become dependent and fall into the cycle of addiction and abuse I just mentioned. I know this as a doctor, and I feel this as someone who's almost died from an opioid overdose myself. You see, several years ago, while I was driving to school on a nice, bright, sunny day, I came to a very busy intersection. And as I started to make my turn, another driver started to change lanes and hit me in my driver's door going about 60 miles an hour. The impact flipped my car over four times, instantly breaking my left foot, my left femur, and causing me to shatter my car window with my face. I had to be life flighted, cut from my car, and life flighted to Parkland, the same trauma hospital they took JFK to when he was shot. During the emergency surgery, I got a, a screw in my left foot, a pin in my left knee, a pin in my left hip, and a titanium rod that runs the length of my left femur. Because I shattered my car with my face, I had a very serious concussion as well. And like most people who've had trauma like this, I was prescribed opioids for the pain. However, like I said, I had a very serious concussion, which means I also had very serious memory problems. So when I got home, I took two of my opioids. And then I forgot, and I took two more. And I forgot, and I took two more. The next thing I knew, I woke up in a pool of my own vomit, and I could still count some of the pills that I had taken. Had I not thrown up, I am quite positive I would not be here with you today. This issue scared me to the point where I had to find a, a solution to our opioid epidemic that was not opioids. What I found was that cannabis, yes, medical marijuana, is the solution to our opioid epidemic. Cannabis has been proven to greatly ease the suffering of pain without the side effects of addiction and death. In fact, from research from the National Institute of Health, it shows that we can reduce, we can replace opioids with cannabis 64% of the time when we need medication for pain. And oftentimes the side effects are much, much better. They're not addiction and death, they're dry mouth, constipation, and maybe feeling a little groggy the next day. Now what if we could apply that 64% number to the statistics I gave you earlier? What if we could have 64% less addiction? What if we could have 64% less death? That's thousands and thousands of lives that we get to recoup every month. These are our brothers, our sisters, our community members. It's not just their lives. It's their gifts, their talents, and their love. Now, we're just imagining here, but this is a dream worth chasing. Now, one of the ways that cannabis is substantially healthier for us and better than opioids is the way that it actually works in the brain. You see, in the brain, there's a little area called the pons. The pons is responsible for our autonomic breathing center. Basically, it's the reason that we keep breathing whenever we're not thinking about it or we're asleep or we're passed out. You see, the funny thing is, is that the pons is a very specific receptor set, and those receptor sets respond very well to opioids. And when they hit opioids hit them, it shuts it off. It makes you stop breathing. The thing is, there's very few receptor sets, if any, in the pons for cannabis. And this is why when people consume giant amounts of cannabis, they survive, because they keep breathing. Opioids make you stop breathing. This one fact alone should show us that this should be our, our alternative to opioids for our pain problems. The biggest issue we have that, though, is cannabis is still illegal in many states. 
The reason it's illegal is because of the way we perceive it, the way we look at it. And so I want to go through some of those, those ideas real quick, because before we can start saving lives with cannabis, we have to change our view of it. So number one, the argument that cannabis, the high or the euphoria from cannabis, makes it unusable for daily life. And I'll agree with you. If you're really high all day, that's going to make it kind of tough to get through your day. The problem is that this isn't a cannabis issue. This isn't any medication issue. Any medication you take too much of is going to give you side effects you don't really want. Just like alcohol or opioids, if we t there's a big difference between consumption and intoxication, between use and abuse. At the end of the day, this is a, this is a dosage issue, and that's really where this lives. And so number two, it's impossible to dose cannabis. And I will tell you, if you're talking about smoking or vaping, you're probably right. I can only imagine how difficult it would be to try to only smoke five milligrams. However, anytime we have giant problems and we have a little bit of time, technology comes through to help us out. This is a sublingual strip. Sublingual strips are extremely doseable. This is 10 milligrams. If you cut it in half, you get five and five. You can cut it more than that if you'd like to. The thing is that the best thing about this is the way that it enters the bloodstream. It dissolves under your tongue and goes directly into the system. This way we can get activation in as little as 10 or 15 minutes, whereas with gummies or pills or anything else, it could take 45 minutes to an hour. Our dosage problems have been solved. Number three, cannabis produces substantial unwanted psychological effects, creates anxiety and things like that. This is actually 100% untrue. What we're actually seeing is that Cannabis can actually remove and eliminate anxiety. And we go back to the brain for this one. Now, cannabis doesn't show off the pawns, which is good, but it does have the ability to shut off something else in the brain, the amygdala. If there's one thing in our bodies we definitely want shut off, it's the amygdala. The amygdala holds all the bad things about mankind. Fear, hate, anger, terror, anxiety. I'm sure lots of you are thinking, Whew, well, that doesn't apply to me. I don't have any anxiety issues. And that's great, but anxiety has another name. We call it stress. This is why when people use cannabis, they talk about this overwhelming sense of peace and relaxation and calm. And they say it's almost as if the stress was just washed away because that's more or less what happens. So you can understand it's not the plant, it's not the medicine, it's our view of it. These perceptions that we have that are negative perceptions are what's really holding us back. And not too long ago, I had to deal with these in a very personal way. My 10-year-old son had to have surgery to remove a plate and six screws from his arm. And I knew it was a big surgery, I knew there was going to be lots of pain, and I was pretty sure they were going to prescribe him opioids, which they did. And so knowing what I know about opioids, what am I supposed to do for my family? Because here's the problem, with these negative side effects, I, these negative stigmas and these negative opinions, I knew he was going to tell everyone, because he, he's 10, he's going to tell everybody everything. And I knew that his friends were going to have negative opinions, and their parents were going to have negative opinions, and the school, and everybody else. At the end of the day, that didn't matter. I had to do what was best and safest for my family. So we used the sublingual strips. So every time he would tell me that his arm started to hurt, I'd cut him a little piece and give it to him. And 10 or 15 minutes later, he'd tell me he felt better, and he'd be able to go back to reading. And because we were able to dose it out really, really well, I didn't notice any psychological change at all. Basically, he never got high. So when you hear things like this, you instantly think, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I wish we had information on this on a bigger, grander scale. And the great thing is we do. The research is showing that states that legalize cannabis see a 24% drop in opioid overdose deaths the first year after legalization. We also see a massive decrease in the amount of opioid prescriptions that are actually filled. When people have safer options, they choose them. Now, I know changing the laws around cannabis means we have to change our cultural view of cannabis. However, giant problems, like the opioid epidemic, require bold action. Our dosing problems have been solved with a new sublingual technology, and so I'm asking with this new information if we can reevaluate our stance on this. Our society cannot sustain the levels of addiction and death we are currently allowing. So I'm asking if we can just unlearn what we have learned and take a fresh look at an old solution. Above all else, keep an open mind. We cannot let the bad information or the old information we've had dictate our actions and rob us of opportunities that we have available to us right now. At the end of the day, we're all going to have to make a decision. Are we going to let the fear of what we thought cannabis was drive us to allow the opioid epidemic to continue? Or are we going to change the way we think? 
Albert Einstein once said, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking we used when we created them. We created the opioid epidemic. We're gonna have to change our thinking if we're gonna solve it. I'm Dr. Matt Chalmers, thank you guys very much.